The story of Caesar's life and death has been the basis of many feature films and literature. However, few people know what compelled Marcus Junius to raise arms against his patron. The conspirators perfectly prepared for the murder. Separated that fateful day Caesar from all his active supporters and even hid nearby a small group of hired gladiators in case someone comes to the aid of Caesar. The only thing they did not foresee was that the citizens of Rome would not support them. Most likely, they could not believe that the common people sincerely loved the man whom they themselves considered a tyrant. Marcus Junius Brutus, as they would say today, was born with a golden spoon in his mouth. The boy's parents, Brutus the Elder and Servilia, came from the most noble families of Rome, whose ancestors sat in the Senate almost from the founding of the city. However, Brutus the Elder took part in an anti-government rebellion and was killed by Gnaeus Pompey. Upbringing of eight-year-old Junius was taken up by his uncle Marcus Porcius Cato. Cato was considered a man of principle, incorruptible, and had an impeccable reputation. Honesty educator sometimes expressed quite strange. In particular, in ancient Rome, it was no secret that all elected positions sold for money. However, there was always a danger that the candidate will make an advance payment and the position and will not get. Cato played the role of intermediary in these circumstances. Candidates would hand the money over to him. If the deal for the post was successful, Cato gave the gold to the bribed voters. If the deal failed, return to the customer. Be that as it may, it is believed that it was Cato who instilled in Brutus such character traits as honesty and justice. Uncle did everything to orphaned nephew receive the best education. During the lifetime of these two figures, there was a rumor that Marcus Junius Brutus was the fruit of adultery. According to Plutarch, Servilia entered into adultery with Caesar when the future commander was only 15 years old. After the death of her husband, Servilia officially became the mistress of Julius. This explains Caesar's paternal attitude towards her and possibly their common son. At the same time, during the civil war between Caesar and Pompey, Brutus supported the latter. The young man was not even embarrassed by the fact that Pompey had once killed his father. On the side of Caesar, Mark joined only after the actual end of the civil war. Julius Caesar made a new friend dizzying career, a year later put the governor of Cisalpine Gaul. This appointment went against the existing laws. Before receiving a province, the candidate had to be elected consul or praetor. Brutus, due to his youth, had never been either. Mark Junius quickly found himself in the circle of the commander's closest associates and seemed to have no personal motives for betrayal. Marcus Junius was a staunch Republican. To protect democracy and be honest with people from childhood taught Brutus Cato. This condition was the reason why Brutus joined Pompey's army. Caesar was a dictator and Pompey was a Republican. When Marcus defected to Julius, he hoped that Caesar would remove his dictatorial powers once the civil war was over. This did not happen. Caesar convinced the Senate to declare himself dictator for life. Brutus, for reasons of conscience, decided to betray his patron. It's worth noting that the phrase, and you, Brutus, is fictitious. According to Roman historians, Caesar's real last words were, and you, my son. Noticing Brutus among the conspirators, Caesar stopped resisting and accepted death by covering his face with a toga. The most important mistake made in his life hereditary Tyrannoborates Marcus Junius Brutus was the choice of the object for Tyrannobortion. Who and how suggested to him that his benefactor Julius Caesar was about to become a tyrant is a separate story. But there is no doubt that by taking an active part in his murder, Brutus thereby signed his own death warrant. Brutus was inspired by the images of the ancient heroes who had made pathetic speeches over the corpse of a defeated villain. He tried to follow their example and explain to the senators, who were horrified by the sight of Caesar's bloody body, the meaning of the murder. But the listeners scattered. To the conspirators joined only four, Publius Cornelius Dolabella, Lucius Cornelius Cinna, Marcus Favonius, and Lucius Statius Mercus. Together with the assassins, they marched into the forum to the Roman people. Contrary to expectations, the Romans greeted the news of the murder of a tyrant who had attacked the ancient liberties of Rome with an ominous silence. Now Junius Brutus had the opportunity to finally make his prepared speech, but no one applauded. 
seeing in the crowd clenched teeth and clenched fists of those who were not going to forgive the murder of the people's favorite leader, the conspirators, just in case, removed to the top of the Capitoline Hill. As historical experience testified, there it was possible to successfully defend against the superior forces of the enemy. The most consistent and persistent enemy of Brutus, Longinus, and other assassins of Caesar was Mark Antony. There was nothing to prevent him from being slaughtered at the same time as Caesar, but the conspirators did not. Moreover, one of them prevented Mark Antony from attending the Senate on that fateful day. Perhaps out of fear that Mark Antony might interfere with their plans, or the conspirators did not want to kill several political opponents at once so as not to spoil their reputation. Because if Caesar could still be called a tyrant, the murder of Mark Antony would be more difficult to justify. After Caesar's death, the opportune moment was missed. As soon as Mark Antony learned of what had happened, he barricaded himself in his mansion. To take his house by storm would have to attract a lot of fighters, and it was dangerous to launch such a battle in the center of Rome, whose population has not yet expressed their unconditional support. But even if Mark Antony was killed at the same time as Caesar, such an act could be fatal for Brutus, Cassius, and other conspirators. The garrison in the capital was under the command of Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, who wanted to immediately capture and execute Caesar's murderers. In our version of the story, he was dissuaded by Mark Antony, who did not want bloodshed in the capital. Without him, Lepidus would have realized his intention. It's hard to say where that would have led. Maybe there would have been a massacre in Rome between Caesarians and their opponents, or maybe on the contrary. The death of Caesar's assassins would have prevented the civil war that began later. Either way, Brutus, the most notorious of the conspirators, would be dead. A day later, it was too late to kill Mark Antony. In secret negotiations, the leaders of both factions guaranteed each other's personal safety. Mark Antony and Lepidus on the one hand, and Cassius and Brutus on the other, mutually swore not to organize assassination attempts and other acts of force. But if Mark Antony could be neutralized by other means, not allowing him to speak at a meeting of the Senate, the conspirators had a chance to achieve their goals. After all, it was Mark Antony made a fateful speech, after which the senators did not dare to declare the late Caesar a tyrant. From that moment on, the assassins could no longer be officially proclaimed heroes. Even more important was the speech of Mark Antony at Caesar's funeral. After it, the Romans wanted to set fire to the homes of the assassins and were looking for them themselves so that they could be dealt with immediately. It became clear that in the capital the conspirators do not have any significant popular support. Brutus and Cassius left the city and then Italy to gather troops in the provinces. The Caesarians gradually squeezed all the conspirators out of Rome. Mark Antony was authorized by the Senate to deal with Caesar's assassins who were declared enemies of the Roman people. The conspirators perfectly prepared for the murder, separated that fateful day Caesar from all his active supporters, and even hid nearby a small detachment of hired gladiators in case someone comes to the aid of Caesar. The only thing they did not foresee was that the citizens of Rome would not support them. Most likely, they could not believe that the common people sincerely love a man whom they themselves considered a tyrant. 